three was still split by mere seconds after stage three, with the F2000 cars clearly dominating proceedings. In N4, Wilkin and Godrich remained the team to beat. This coverage of the Total Swartland Rally is brought to you by... African Motorsport. As darkness fell, it was time for the first of two super special stages. Stages that put two cars at a time against each other on the track. The pressure of competing against another crew head-to-head -head can lead to mistakes, and every second counts. No less than three cars tied for the top spot, while the top ten were covered by only three seconds. Most surprising of all was Wilkin, who put his track experience to good use to score a time just one second off the fastest S2000s. The close results also underline just how important the margins gained on the earlier gravel stages had now become. The so-called slower N4 cars weren't far off the S2000s and the A7s were also getting mixed up in the fray. The difference between JP Damso in the fastest of the S2000 and Tien Hubert's A7 Polo in 20th spot was a mere 12 seconds. second super special proved just as spectacular and as close as the first with the times again very closely matched Gemmel was quickest followed by Serge and Etienne in a tied second the next four were all only two seconds back on the leader and included Cronier in the indecently quick A7 run -X. Both the BP Volkswagen racing polos of Kuhn and Habich spun, losing precious seconds in the process. Habich blamed cold tyres and brakes on the faux pas. He was languishing well back in seventh place and clearly not enjoying the rally. It was a difficult start to this rally. We, uh, we had a handling problem in the first stage and then we got that fixed up and then the second stage we went through water and got uh, water into the electrics and misfire for five, six k's. Another 20 seconds missing, so not a good start, but you know, there's four couple of stages left and we'll try our best. Lawrence was also struggling. Man, I'm basically the guinea pig for some setups that we've done uh, by choice as well. Um, but it's, I have, I'm trying every stage to do adjustments. It's getting better, but I'm not on the pace yet. So I think hopefully by tomorrow it is handling the rough stuff a little bit better. But uh, we now have to sacrifice uh, traction, which we're working on. So uh, not on the pace yet and we're just holding it there. On the N4 front, Fernando Reuter was hoping for a strong showing, even though he's blown his chances for the championship. But the Cape-based Spaniard was struggling to get to grips with his Mitsubishi. Yeah, um, it hasn't been a great one for us yet. We can't really find a rhythm. You know, we were, we had a very nice rhythm in the last few rallies, and we're just uh, cycling a bit. The car feels quite good, so we can't really see why or why not. I've got a few things to change for the gravel. And hopefully it'll work. It's mainly just a bit of lack of confidence. You know, when some, we're breaking a bit early, I think I'm breaking a bit too early. And obviously the stopwatch doesn't like that. Thus, at the end of day one, with five stages complete, Sergeant Gemmel, where in a Toyota 1-2 at the head of the field, but with two BP VW Polos breathing down their necks, less than 10 seconds behind. Looking at the classes, Fasaki and Lecranzi were heading in three, with Stephen Wilkin and Gert Nilaber heading up A6. In A5, Char Kunradi and Alvin Kutsia were still setting the pace. Saturday dawned partly cloudy, with some predicting the possibility of rain. Stage 6 was a rerun of Stage 1, and most of the crews hoped to do better second time round. Most had opted for normal rubber on the first day, but some now chose wets in the hope of finding just that little bit of extra grip. However, many of the stages had been punished by the procession of rally cars, and the route was rutted and rough in places, mitigating against faster times. 
John Williams hasn't shown his full potential in the fast and tricky S2000 Volkswagen Polo this year, but is slowly getting to grips with the car. Damso is the other new entrant to the S2000 fray, and he too has not always been able to make the most of his team total run X's speed and traction. The cars are not only very rapid, but complex to set up, something that only comes with experience. Day, Abek and Judd were on a mission, but they still dropped 10 seconds to the leaders here. Team colleagues Kuhn and Hodgson were only three seconds quicker, but looked on the edge. Lawrence, now happier with his car setup, was driving with increased confidence. Pekin, leading the championship, now needed to get the bit between his teeth if he was intent on attacking the leading Toyotas. Although pressing on, he tied with Kuhn and Lawrence for joint third. On this stage, the polo speed was obvious. But it wasn't fast enough to pip Gemmel to the post. The Toyota driver wasn't hanging about, and with only a handful of seconds separating him from the lead, it looks as if he was trying to chase down Damso. But Serge is always difficult to beat on his home soil, and he looked very much in control. There's life in the old dog yet. Local hero Mike Nathan had acquired the services of navigator Robin Houghton and was pushing his Toyota Corolla hard. He was second fastest in A7 here, behind the Quicksilver Cronier. The Velarc sisters were enjoying themselves. They were sixth fastest in N4 here. Fife and Harding was soldiering on, despite the previous day's puncture, which effectively put them out of contention. in the thick of the N4 battle and intent on giving it stick in the hope of a strong finish. With the N4 championship in his sights, he had to balance speed with the need to finish. appeared more in the groove after the overnight and managed to beat Fissa on this stage, but he has no real championship hopes. second here in N4 and staying in touch with the front-running Wilkin. Wilkin's resolve to finish well, combined with a completely rebuilt car, made him hard to beat here. Not where we should be, a little bit down. One second behind Fernando and about five or six behind Nicholas and those are the two guys I've got to worry about now. 
so uh, we, we will pick up the pace because I need to catch up what I lost in the car stages yesterday. On the total I had 60k stage, I was 30 seconds behind Nick also after a couple of overshoots and I took one and a half minutes off there. So um, if needs be I will go absolutely flat out in that stage. song and they're putting us under pressure um, they have been uh, all events you know we've, we've managed to to just stay ahead of them as you know after the whole first day we were almost equal so uh, I think the pressure's on today you know we're waiting for the first guy to make the mistake I think that's really the decider of the event um, it's, a, it's a lot of mileage to to pass through right at the end um, I think that's why Serge would probably be pushing very hard right now to try and make up uh, a, a gap uh, and go in there with a bit of a comfort uh, zone. But, you know, if it comes to the crunch, I think we'll all have to go flat out in that stage. That's the, the, the nature of the sport, you know. You, you can't choose when you have to attack. And if we have to attack in the long stage, it's good. I think uh, we have a reliable car. The VW hasn't... Uh, given us a reliability problem all year long. So in, in that sense, it's a good car to attack a stage. Stage seven was the same as Friday's stage two. And again, it was Serge who put the hammer down. On this stage, he showed his rivals a thing or two, taking 11 seconds off Gemmel. Fekin was starting to lose touch with the front and needed something special to keep his victory hopes alive. He was beaten here by the end for Subaru of Vulcan. J.P. Damso's pace was also a little off song and he was tipped on the stage by an ever-improving Williams. The youngster is being tipped as a future star. Hubbock set the same time as Williams but was three seconds slower than an enthusiastic Lawrence. Enzo, it was a disastrous stage after a wrong slot saw him lose more than a minute to the leaders. Gemmo was at it hammer and tongs and took a full eight seconds off Lawrence. But on day two, the undisputed king of the Swatland was Serge Damso, the only driver to break 15 minutes on this test. He remained firmly in the lead. So far, everything is falling in place and the car's behaving itself and uh, the car's actually very good at the moment, so there's no really complaint. So, you know, the rally is a long way to go still. And there's only a few seconds in between and uh, you know, we've got 40 odds and another 30. So we've got about another 70 cases to do. You know, so anything, one overshoot and everything's all over. Mm -hmm. It must be the most competitive formula at the moment we've had for since I've been rallying, I think. With the Toyotas in positions one and two, Johnny Gamble was in high spirits as well. It's quite a bit different from the N4s, but no, it's nice when you drive it hard, it's nice. For Fekin, the rally was going pear-shaped and the times were just not there. Obviously, it's something at the back. Um, right rear puncture. Lost about 40 seconds and um, put us back quite a bit. We're now lying fifth, I think, yeah. And uh, Etienne and, and JP's ahead of us. So, it's hard work. We have to come back. I think the long stage is, is also going to play Ivok. Um, you know, 
you could just as well get a puncture there or someone else could get a puncture so I reckon on that stage it's it's going to change. Nathan was turning out to be one of the surprises of the day. On this stage Costa Comanturac has raised a few eyebrows with an impressive time rubbing shoulders with much quicker machinery. The rally chicks were going great guns. The experience of rallying in Africa has obviously impacted positively on their performance back home too. Pfeiffer and Harding were still putting their Lancer Evo 6 through its paces. Let's compare the lines and styles of Reuter in the Team Total Lancer Evo and the Pertec Subaru of Duplessis on the same stretch of road. Trissa was just quicker here. Ryan wasn't hanging about either, intent on not letting Wilkin run away with the N4 class. The M3 gaggle is one of the feistiest groups in local rallying. And despite their junior status, these machines are tough to drive. With limited power and no Alice diff, you have to maintain high cornering speeds and keep the momentum up if you want to be competitive. For Barry Hroblard, an encounter with the Guinea Fowl got the adrenaline pumping, it cost him time on stage seven.